Welcome. Um, so this is all a bit rushed. So I apologize if there are any uh, rough edges around this. We basically decided on Friday night that we will be doing this. Um, but welcome to our virtual lab, bare metal reverse engineering and hardware hacking. We will look a bit at reverse engineering a bare metal firmware, and then Dimitri will take over and talk a bit about uh, doing a hardware attack to bypass a chip security measure. Now, um, ah, okay, I also just learned that I'm in the wrong Slack channel, but uh, basically I just posted the crack me that we will reverse engineer into Slack. So um, if you want to join at home, feel free to download to download it and also download Ghidra and SVD loader, and then you'll be able to uh, to do what I do, basically. And also, if you have any question, please just post them into Slack. I'll try my best to, to answer as soon as I see them. So let's start by talking about bare metal devices. So we all know about smartphones and so on, which have very powerful processors. But there are a lot of devices around us that have less powerful processors in them, such as hardware wallets or general IoT devices, fitness trackers, and even in cars. If you take a car apart, you probably find 200 different processors uh, that are that don't run a, a real operating system. So let's talk a bit about what bare metal means. So we are all on the same page. So um, on a normal computer or on a smartphone, an application that you write will run on top of an operating system. And this operating system will then use drivers to talk to the actual hardware. Now um, on a bare metal device, our application runs directly on the hardware. There's no real operating system. There's no large hardware abstraction and so on. Instead, for each hardware we run on, we have to, to ship all the drivers and all the stuff that we need to talk to the hardware with our application. Now, the best example in our circles for an embedded device that uh, is not bare metal is probably the Raspberry Pi, because in most cases it runs Linux, even though you can program it bare metal, uh, only a few people are crazy enough to actually do it. And then on the bare metal side, the most popular example is probably just the Arduino. Now, today we will look at bare metal devices based on ARM processors. And ARM has a lot of different classes of processors. For example, we have the uh, Cortex-A, we have the Cortex-M, we have the Cortex-R and so on. And the Cortex-A are the, the big processors that you have, for example, in your smartphone. The Cortex-R are the processors for real-time applications such as in industrial or automotive controls. And then we have the Cortex-M, which is the microcontrollers. And today we will only look at Cortex-M devices. Now, what makes a Cortex-M device is that it has no memory management unit. So there's no virtual memory. There's no real way to run a real operating system with like process isolation and so on on it. And also compared to a Cortex-A, they are very slow. So they start at like 20 megahertz or so and go up to a couple of hundred megahertz. And they have very small amounts of flash and RAM. So for example, in most cases, you have a couple of kilobytes of RAM release. So there's not a lot of space on most of these devices. Also, most of the ones that are on the market right now are single core, even though dual core and even uh, more cores are getting more and more common. Now, uh, it wouldn't be ARM if there weren't a hundred different versions of Cortex M's. And so, for example, there's Cortex M0, M0 plus M1, M3, M4, and so on and so forth. And uh, Wikipedia has this great graphic, uh, this great table that shows you what's what and basically we, as hackers, we don't really care about the differences between these these processors. But for example, the instruction pipeline is different and even the computer architecture. And so, for example, all the smaller Cortex M zeros and so on are based on the von Neumann architecture, while the M3, M4 and so on are Harvard based. But uh, we don't really care. Um, but one more thing to note is that the ARM architecture, so the instruction set you can use on these is also different. And so, for example, on the M zeros, you need to use an ARM v6M assembler, and on the M3, you need an ARM v7. But today, we don't really care about that. Um, if you've ever written code for older or bigger ARM processors, you probably know that the real or the original ARM instruction set is a fixed width 32 bit instruction set. This instruction set is not supported on ARM Cortex M devices. Instead, they only support the thumb and thumb v2 instruction sets, so that you have 16-bit instructions, uh, and sometimes with uh, Thumb v2, even smaller 32-bit instructions. Now, let's look at a specific processor. And so today we will look, for example, at, at the STM32, 
uh, from ST Microelectronics. The STM32 is super common in a lot of devices. And what's nice about it is that you can get breakout boards such as these for like $16 shipped on Amazon and so on. And so if you want to play around with uh, with chips that are very well supported by open source tool chains and so on, the STMs are are really easy to work with compared to some of the others. And basically, this chip has a lot of peripherals integrated. So we have general purpose input outputs, which is basically just a pin. So one of these gold small pins on here, and you can do with those whatever you want. You can turn them on, off, and so on. It has uh, hardware support for serial, I squared C, and so on. And if you go on the STM32 uh, F4, in this case, website, you can see that it has a lot of stuff such as CAN bus, a camera interface, SPI, and so on and that it runs at 180, me uh, 180 megahertz. You can also see that it only has 512 kilobytes of flash memory and only 128 kilobytes of, uh, of RAM. So there's not a lot of space for stuff on there, but it still is able to drive a lot, a lot, a lot of different things. How are these, um, these peripherals such as I2C or the camera interface implemented? Basically, if you check the data sheet of the STM32F4, you can see that the, uh, that the pins on the device are organized in ports. So for example, here I've highlighted port A. And we can configure each pin of these ports. In this case, port A has 16 pins. Uh, to be, for example, a general purpose input output, and then we can blink an LED. So we would set it to output and then turn it on or off and so on. Now we can also switch the mode of these pins to different, to for example, I2C, which would allow us to drive a display and so on. And we have a lot of these ports, for example, on this chip, we have port A, port B, and port C. And notably, not always all pins of these ports are available. So for example, depending on how you configure the chip, uh, the pins on the left might be used for the clock instead of being used for general purpose input outputs. Now, how do we talk to these peripherals, given that we don't have an operating system that we can use to, to for example, say, hey, open a file, or hey, turn on the display? Uh, this is done using something called memory mapped peripherals or memory mapped I.O. Basically, you have your flash, your RAM, and all your peripherals in a flat memory space. And so, for example, your flash on the STM32 will be at hex 800, your RAM will be at hex 2000 and your peripherals will be at hex 4000. And if you want to find this for a specific processor, just go into the data sheet and search for memory map. And that will bring up this nice diagram going into a lot of details on which address ranges are for which peripheral or for flash and so on and so forth. And for example, if we zoom into uh, the lower part right here, we can see that the flash memory of our processor starts at hex 800 and that our RAM starts at hex 2000. And if we go back, we can see that there's one big area reserved for peripherals, which are extended on the right side. And um, these APB, AHB, and so on, just are different buses that are in the chip. We don't really care how these works or what they do. Oh, but uh, if we go, if we search in the data sheet for, for example, AHB1, we get another memory map for all the things that are on this bus. And so, for example, in this case, on AHB1, we can see that all the GPIO peripherals, so all the things that we need to turn on and off an LED or so, are on AHB1 and start at hex 4002. And so, for example, GPIO A is at just hex 4002.0000. And uh, if we go into the GPIO register, part of the data sheet, we can see that basically there are 32 bit wide registers in the memory that we can use to control it. So for example, if we want to control the mode of this, uh, of a GPIO, we just go to the address offset zero. So for example, we know that GPIO A is at 4002 plus zero, and then we have the address of this mode register. And we can now adjust the mode of whatever pin we are interested in changing the mode of by just writing to all of these two bits. And you can see down here, if we set uh, one mode R0, for example, to 0, 0, it will be an input. If we set it to 1, it will be an output. We have 1, 0, which is alternate, uh, alternate function mode, which we need to use if we, for example, want to use I squared C or so. 
And then we also have an analog mode where we, for example, can read analog data such as voltages and so on. Um, now let's say we want to set a pin to be an output. All we have to do is set the least significant bit of this address to one. And so, for example, we would just write one to hex 4002. Um, now to turn this pin on, because so far we've only set it to be an output, we haven't turned it on or off yet. Um, for that, we need to use the output data register. And again, we have the output data register. We can see that it has for each pin in the port, we have 16 pins per port. We have a single bit that we can set either to one or to zero. And we again can cal calculate the address. So this register would be at hex 4002 and 14. And if we want to turn on pin zero and pin one, we simply write uh, the, the least significant bit and the second bit just by writing, for example, three to this port. And if we want to turn it off, we just write zero. Now, how do we do now? How do we, uh, analyze a firmware in Ghidra? So, um, basically I've created a small crack me. If you're in the Slack ch channel, you will find it there. You can download it. And if we drag the, this file into, into Ghidra, we get the, import dialog. Now, if you would load a regular binary, so for example, if I were to load, um, for example, if I were to load uh, just, let's say, uh, the copy executable, you could see that Ghidra would detect it as a Mac OS X Mac O binary. Um, but in the case of a bare firmware, it's just a random binary file and Ghidra doesn't know how to analyze it and how to load it. And so if I drag it in, the format will just be raw, raw binary. This means that we have to tell Ghidra about the language that this file is written in. And in our case, this is uh, a firmware for these STM32 breakout boards. And so in our case, I know that we are loading a Cortex firmware. And so I have to open the language dialog, type in, for example, Cortex. And there are two options here, Big Endian and Little Endian. Now, in theory, there are Cortex M processors that are Big Endian. But in the wild, you will see that basically they do not exist. Like nobody will be, uh, like basically you will never encounter a big Indian Cortex M chip, most probably. And so we just like little double click it, hit OK. And uh, now we also need to set the load address. Now we just saw in the data sheet that basically there are, um, if we go to the data sheet of this chip, the flash memory is at hex 0800. Now we know that our firmware will probably be loaded into flash. And so let's set the load address that we will use to hex 800, hit okay, hit okay again, and double click this file. Now, oops, this is coming up on the wrong screen. Now Ghidra will ask you whether you want to analyze this file. Now we absolutely do not want to analyze this file yet because we first want to finish setting up Ghidra to to know about the processor we are using. And so we hit no right here. And then we go back to the, to the data sheet of our processor and we can see that the flash memory is as, at hex 0800. Our um, RAM is at hex 2000. But we also see that at hex 0000, that these addresses will be mapped either to flash, system memory or SRAM. Now, in most cases where the firmware is regularly running, uh, this will be at, will be mapped to flash. And so we have to make Ghidra aware that our flash is not only at hex 800, it's also at hex 000. And we also want to make sure that we have our SRAM memory block mapped and so on. And so in Ghidra, you can do all of these things by going to, uh, to tools, uh, sorry, to window memory map. And it's coming up on the wrong screen. And here we can see that our flash, the binary we just loaded was loaded at hex 800 and so on, and we can create a new memory block. And so for example, we're gonna call this flash mirror. It's, it will be at uh, address zero. It will have the same length as the flash that we just loaded. So to the OC will be executable and um, we will initialize it with the file bytes. So it will have the same contents. We hit okay. And now we have that. Now we all also wanna create a block for the RAM. So we have our RAM, it starts at hex 2000. And let me check the data sheet. How long is the RAM? It goes up to one FFFFFF. So let's 
copy that in. Uh, also set this to execute and volatile. The volatile flag is important in this case because RAM might change under you. So without you noticing, as so you want to make sure that the decompiler is aware that, that RAM will always uh, can change so it doesn't optimize some stuff away. And we just leave this to initialized and hit OK. All righty. And now we are ready to go. Now we can actually analyze our file. And so I'm going to go to uh, analysis and hit auto analyze. And now with firmware, the problem is that it doesn't have a structure like an entry point or so in, in most cases. So for example, if you load an elf binary, it has a defined entry point and then the entry point will jump to your main function and so on. We don't really have that in, in firmware. We often have a reset vector uh, of which we know the address. We often have, uh, interrupt vectors where we can guess the addresses and so on. But Ghidra also has an analyzer called ARM Aggressive Instruction Finder. And this one is really, really useful because it basically allows you to, uh, allows Ghidra to try to find instructions anywhere in the binary. And so it will just go through the binary and see, oh, does this look like ARM code? If yes, it will mark it as code. And so this is really useful. And so let's check it and hit analyze and we can see on the bottom right, a lot of stuff happens. And we can see a lot of colors changing here on the right side. And that's already it. We are done. And uh, <clears throat> and before we start analyzing it, I want to show you what this uh, crack me actually does. I should have done this earlier. Apologies. Um, so basically, I have I've put a small crack me on this device. And uh, if I hit if I hit reset, you can see it says hack in the box, bare metal, crack me, enter the correct combination of signals and press the button. And if we just press the button on here, it will just say unlock criteria, not met, try again. And so our goal will be to reverse engineer this check. And, uh, oh, I'm just gonna, got a question. Um, so we, we just hit the button, we can see unlock criteria not met. And so we want to reverse this crack me and figure out what exactly is going on and what does it want us to do. Now we could go, for example, to address zero and we can see the full reset vector here. And so, um, so we can see that uh, on reset, our CPU jumps to this function, which does something and so on. But in a lot of cases where I look at firmware, I I try to, to figure out what would be the best point to figure out where to start. And in our case, we, uh, we just saw that it has some strings. And so let's see where are those strings used. And that will probably bring us very close to where we need to look to, um, to reverse the crack me. And so let's go to the strings window, just click on window and you have defined strings. And you can see indeed, we have, uh, the enter the correct combination of signals. We have, uh, the flag, which unfortunately in the binary we got is uh, censored. We have this, the string we just saw. And you can also see that these are here twice. This is because we have the flash mirrored. And so it will be twice in memory, once at zero, 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 and once at zero, um, 800. So let's just click on one of these strings and see if we get any references to it. And here in the listing view, you can see that indeed our string HITB bare metal uh, crack me is used at two addresses, which are actually the same. And we can just double click this to jump here. And we, we get into this nice function where we can see, oh, our string is used, uh, enter the correct combination. And then we also see this success uh, message and so on. Now, when I reverse engineer something, I, I really like, uh, let me answer a question on Slack real quick. Uh, H I T B. Lockdown C. Uh, apologies, I'm just trying to do this. All right. Um, okay. And so if I see this and I know this string is output to the serial console, I will just blindly call the function that I'm, uh, I would just call it, for example, probably serial print because, whoops, that's fix the typo, just because it looks a lot like this is probably the function that prints something on serial. Now I could go ahead and, and click on it and see if this is actually true and so on. But I mean, do you really have to? I'm, I'm a hacker, I'm lazy. Um, but let's still go up and see what these functions do. Maybe we, we need to know. And so here, if we click on this, we can see some strange numbers going on and we can see 
um, that this basically will write something to 4002 or so. And now we could, what we could do is go into the data sheet and figure out what, whoops, figure out what's at 4002 um, what was the full name? 4002 oops. Three eight zero zero. Where do we have it here? And we can see uh, this sets up the RCC, which is the peripheral clock management, and so on. But the problem is, if you do this over and over and over again, and manually see a number, go back to the data sheet, figure out what it, what it does, and so on, it gets old really quickly and burns a lot of time. But luckily, there's something called SVD files, System View Description files, and these are basically files that that contain uh, a description of all the peripherals of the chip. And so, for example, in, a, in the, an SVG file, we would have uh, the address of our GPIOs, we would have the address of the UART driver, and so on. And I wrote a script called SVD Loader for Ghidra, uh, which you can find out on GitHub, which allows you to load these SVD files. And what's nice is that, for example, Kyle gives us SVD files for hundreds and hundreds of chips. And so, um, if we go into Ghidra, uh, I'm just going to call this, as we know, RCC something and go back to the function we came from. Uh, and for example, here we see some more uh, addresses that are probably in the peripheral range, but that we don't know yet. But if we load the script called, whoops, so I just go to the scripts window, level down security. If you don't see a script in, in this list, you have to add it to the script path. So click this button and then at whatever directory you uh, cloned SVD loader to. And then we just double click it. And it will ask us to select an SVD. Now there, I have a lot, a lot of SVDs. There's this nice Simsys SVD GitHub repository where you can find uh, hundreds of different or almost thousands, I guess, SVD files. And in this case, I even have an SVD file for the STM F446 that I'm using on this board. And so I'm just going to double click this and it will take a while. Da -da -da -dum. I should have put a, a Jeopardy sample on here. Oops. Oh, hello. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Took a while. Uh, I'm not sure why. But anyway, now you can see that the red address here uh, turned into GPIO C. And so now we know that whatever red address this was is now GPIO C. And if we, for example, um, check out what's behind this, so we can see that this data here that is put in this function is actually a pointer. And so if we hit P, we can convert this into a pointer and we can see, oh, okay, this, oops, this configures GPIO A. And if we do the same here, we can see this is probably a pointer. Ah, this configures the UART and so on. And now without even touching the data sheet, we already know that, okay, this is like, start something. So US ART is the serial, con is the, the serial port. Uh, we know that this is also uh, use out something, so we can call it use out something too, and so on. I'm not going to label all of these because we don't really need it. And then we also have GPIOA, so this probably configures the GPIOA port for whatever. And uh, but let's go back to what we actually want to reverse, which is uh, the crack me. And we can see that the actual crack me is is happening in here. So we can see enter the correct uh, cr combination of signals. And then this happens. Now let's see what's behind this. If we double click a data point, we, get, we jump to it and we can just hit P to convert it to a pointer or you can click or you can do a right click and set data to pointer. And we can see that this actually points to the GPIOC PUPDR register. Let's see what exactly the PUPDR register is in the data sheet. Uh, yeah. So um, there's always there are always two documents for a chip that you need to be aware of. There's the data sheet, which is 200 pages, and then there's the reference manual, which is 1,300 pages. And so it's uh, it's huge. And so let's just search for 
PUPR and we can see, oh, okay, PUPR just sets the pull-ups and pull-downs on, uh, on the GPIO. That's some electrical stuff we don't, we are not really bothered by, but let's just call this um, GPIO C pull-ups. <clears throat> and we can see another right here, this time, oops. And we can see that this sets GPIO C to zero. Now, if we go back to the data sheet, we can see that this basically just sets the pin direction of GPIO C to be uh, inputs because we earlier saw two zeros mean inputs. This just sets the entire GPIO C to be an input. And then we can see that the pull-ups are activated. And so uh, um, a nice trick if you see zero XAA but want to see it as binary is that you can, in the listing view, right-click it and convert it to binary. And we can see, okay, this for the one, two, three, four, for the first uh, four pins, this will enable pull-ups. Uh, if we go to the data sheet, we can see this, uh, uh, sorry, pull-downs. So it basically sets for pin zero, one, two, and three, it sets it to be a pull-down. And so we know what this does and we can go into, into the actual uh, loop. <clears throat> Now the first variable here is PUVR1. And so let's track back and see what this does. Um, again, we can, oops. We can convert this to be uh, to a pointer and name this, okay, this is the GPIOC input data. And this will basically always hold whatever input state we have on GPIOC. So if we go into the data sheet again, we can see that IDR is the input data register. And if we have a pin configured as an input, we can just read the single bits to see whether, for example, the button connected to it is pressed or not pressed and so on. Um, now, to, uh, to make this a bit easier, I can tell you that this basically just reads the button. And so it basically waits for a button press. And because as we saw earlier in the console, if we press the button, oops, we get the try again message. And so this just waits for the button. Um, whoops. And if we, oh man, what's going on here? Sorry, my computer is a bit laggy here. Ah, here. And so, whoops, unlock criteria. Let's name this unlock criteria. And we can see that um, it waits for the button press and then it checks a condition. And if this condition is not met, it says, oh, unlock criteria is not met. Please try again and we have to start over. And so our correct me content is in this year. And this basically just reads the GPIOC input data um, and then checks whether the least, four, uh, the least four bits of it are equal to two. This basically just means that what we have to do is, is somehow on the GPIOC input set the second pin to, uh, to true and suddenly our correct me will be solved. And so for example, I can do this by uh, using a simple jumper wire. So I've checked in the data in the data sheet of the board where my pin two is, and I just apply some voltage to it, press the button, and we've reversed the correct me. And so now this is obviously a very simple example on how you can reverse some something in Ghidra, but um, this can this can be done on a lot of things. And so for example, if we if we check a different processor, the LPC1334, it has something called the, uh, the CRP, which is the code read protection. And so this basically is uh, a piece of code that checks whether, uh, that checks whether the debug interface that gives you access to, for example, read the flash, read the RAM and so on is available uh, to be used or whether it's locked down. And so for example, on a hardware wallet, you would try to, uh, to lock this down and on a, on a dev board, you would leave it open if possible. And what's a nice attack is if we could somehow re-enable this code read protection. And so this code read protection on the LPC is implemented by writing to uh, a certain address in Flash. And so again, we can check the, uh, the reference manual. And basically the code read protection works by checking whether a specific pattern is in Flash. In this case, uh, at address uh, it checks address 2FC. And so what I've done is I've loaded into Ghidra 
the boot ROM of the LPC chip. And if we go to and um, if we go to the RS0x2FC, and I've already set up the memory map sensor one, you can see this. Uh, you can see this right here. I've already set up flash as one and so on. And you can see that we can actually, by loading the, the boot ROM, we can see where this code read protection is read. And so, for example, uh, we can see, if we click here, we can see that there's some code that works on the code read protection and so on. And we can start reverse engineering the boot ROM and try to figure out how exactly does it work? How can we potentially bypass it? And how can we find vulnerabilities? And now this would take a lot of time, but there's a nice other trick because we now know as we, as we have the boot ROM, which is executed on each start of the chip, as we know that it's read from flash each time the chip boots, we can do something called a glitching attack or fault injection attack. And so basically, if you look at the power supply of a chip, if you manage to somehow interrupt the power supply for a couple of nanoseconds at a very precise time, you're able to change the behavior of the chip. And so this is called glitching. And what you can do with it is, for example, skip instructions or corrupt flash reads and write, uh, writes, corrupt register writes and so on. And uh, what we can do, and as we know that the chip is reading this from flash on every boot, this means that we'll, what we could do, oh, my camera just died. Um, one second. <laughs> this means, I hope you can see me again. This means that what we can do this means that what we can do is basically um, is basically try to do this glitching, this voltage glitch at a very precise point in time on every single boot. And I'm going to give over to my colleague Dimitri, who will uh, explain the details of that. So Dimitri, uh, away you go. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, so uh, now we're gonna take a look at glitching. And so the specific device that we're gonna look at is I have in front of me on this table. So let's switch to that. So we're gonna take a look at this guy right here. So this is uh, an LPC 1343 uh, development board. And uh, we'll actually be triggering the glitch uh, using this right here, which is uh, an RD, uh, a digital and RD uh, F FPGA uh, board. But let's just briefly take a look. Uh, so I'm going to share the slides uh, just with, oops. Uh, I, sorry, it's in the other corner. Um, I'm assuming they will be right back. Sorry, uh, I unfortunately forgot to give uh, Chrome the rights to share my screen. So let's try one more time. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, let me just check really quickly. So everything else looks good. All right, so let's just take a quick look. So I'm going to switch to Keynote. Uh, and let's just take a quick look at this. So. Basically, this is our board right here that we're going to take a look at. And uh, like Thomas already explained, so what we want to actually do is glitch the boot ROM. So uh, with something like uh, with something like uh, with Gidra, we can actually go and we can analyze and find vulnerabilities in this boot ROM. So like Thomas said, it turns out on this specific microcontroller, it only checks uh, the it only checks the um, the value one time during boot, and so. That actually means that it's very easy to trigger. So all we need to do is reset the board. We can perform a glitch, which we'll take a look at in a second. And then we can uh, recycle everything and try again. And, and during every single boot up of the microcontroller, we can actually look and check, uh, is it is it working or is it not working, uh, et cetera. So basically, 
so basically, uh, th there's a couple, I mean, in terms of the glitch theory, uh, a lot of people ask about this. So you have to think of overclocking as the example that I always use. And I think especially hackers are familiar with overclocking. So if you want to run something at a higher frequency, it needs more voltage. So we're going to do the exact opposite. We're dropping the voltage, which means that running at the same frequency, the system actually becomes uh, less stable. So, I mean, that's the gist of what we're doing. And so uh, what, what does that mean, less stable? Well, data is actually going to get corrupted. So that means that, for example, instead of reading on a 32-bit bus, instead of reading, uh, let's say, uh, all Fs, it's going to read an E somewhere. Or uh, instead of reading all zeros, it's going to read a, a single bit that's one. And depending on what the actual comparison is that's happening uh, in the microcontroller firmware, uh, in the boot ROM, uh, that'll affect uh, essentially the security of the device. So in this case, I mean, Thomas already said it, and I said it a couple times. It's going to be just a, a single a single check uh, that happens. And uh, unfortunately, 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 I mean, this guy boots off of an external, uh, um, or sorry, off of an internal RC oscillator, uh, which has the I mean disadvantage that we can't uh, control it somehow externally, uh, but. Fortunately, it'll, it'll still work, but we do have to make some modifications. So basically, this is what we're doing. We have uh, we have a reset that happens at some point in time. That's the end reset signal that's green. Uh, and at some later point in time, what's actually happening is uh, we're, uh, at, we're gonna trigger the glitch. So we're gonna drop the voltage for a very short amount of time and uh, basically go from there. So the so how does this look like in practice, specifically with this chip? So it turns out the security is based on a magic value that gets stored at 2FC. And so this is something that Thomas was already showing in the in the, um, in the the actual manual for this microcontroller. So it turns out uh, there's uh, exactly four values that uh, apply security to the chip. And those values are, and this is not a joke, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 876 uh, 54321, et cetera. If it's not one of those values, then it treats it as unlocked. And you can uh, verify this just by reading uh, the, the document that uh, that um, NXP will provide for you. So basically, you have to think of it like four values lock the device. And since we're talking about ARM 32 bits, that means two to the 32 minus four values unlock the device. So chances are very uh, good that we can actually unlock this device. So to secure the device, uh, the user, again, has to explicitly uh, write a specific magic value. And since 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, since these patterns are not valid ARM opcodes, uh, I mean, I guess the assumption is that uh, NXP made one designing this is that you'll never accidentally put code there that will lock the device. So. Uh, let's take a look at what it's like to talk to a bootloader because we're talking about uh, the bootloader, the boot ROM. So basically, uh, if you look very carefully, it'll say uh, the if if the so another thing that you commonly have is that uh, you might actually have more than one bootloader. And if you ever given the choice, you always pick the most simple interface available to you. And in this case, uh, that happens to be the your interface. So that means we can just connect with a, a serial console and talk to this bootloader and play around with it. And that's uh, basically uh, one of the first things that we'll try to do. Uh, then we're actually, we can go and set the security of the bootloader. Uh, and uh, essentially, then we can go from there. OK, so this, again, I just showed this slide just because this is the what we actually have to implement on the FPGA. So I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on how uh, that's done. But basically, we need to generate a delay and a width. And so essentially, after a certain amount of time, i.e. the delay, uh, which has is a 16-bit value, we need to do something for an 8-bit value, so 0 to 255. And this, these are all units. It's units. These are clock cycles of the FPGA. So what we're actually doing inside the FPGA is we're uh, building counters uh, that actually control all of this. And how do we actually switch and manipulate the voltage? Well, you can grab uh, an analog multiplexer like this one, the MAX4619. And so I have VCC and V glitch. Those are just two arbitrary input voltages. I mean, you can see this device actually normally runs at 3.3, but we're taking it down all the way to 1.6. Because Why do we take it that low? Because it's less stable at that point uh, when we when we start to glitch it. It's already running at the, at the bare minimum, uh, and we can go from there. 
So uh, let's pretty much let's pretty much get into it. So last thing, uh, just this is I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but this is as simple as the logic is inside the FPGA. So we have uh, the command uh, module, uh, which is uh, the module that actually processes the commands that we can then send from a nice scripting language like Python. So we'll actually use Python uh, to configure the FPGA and configure the glitch. And then we need to reset the board. After we reset the board, we need to wait for a delay. And after the delay is up, uh, we can pulse and toggle the voltage. So uh, let me switch back. Oops. Uh, let me switch. Oops. Oh, sorry, my escape wasn't working. So uh, let me switch to my uh, let me switch to the camera. So uh, let's talk about this one more time. So here's the FPGA board. Uh, this is the microcontroller board. So, uh, and we're gonna be using a power supply. And this is something that I already had a chance to rig up, which is uh, a multiplexer, which uh, we'll discuss in a second. But basically this is just gonna match the schematic that I had on the previous screen. So let's take a, let's, let's, the first thing that we can do is we can just try to talk to the bootloader on here. So there's uh, one modification that we have to make at the very beginning, which is we actually have to be able to get it into the bootloader. For that, we need one more connection uh, on, on this board. Uh, and this is actually described in the data sheet. So let's go for it. So let's modify it. So I'm gonna grab my soldering iron, which are over here to the side. So we'll just need one for this part. And I'm just gonna add a connection and we'll need a male to female wire for this. Uh, and I'm just gonna add a connection to uh, the microcontroller right here. Uh, and this connection, like I said, it's documented if you uh, read the data sheet and it's gonna be the fourth pin over here it's gonna be the second column over and the fourth pin. Uh, and this pin we need to connect to ground. Fortunately, we have this JTAG connector right here and that'll actually, uh, this JTAG connector has almost all the signals that are ground, a bunch of them are unused. So we can actually use that uh, and uh, connect, connect the signal there. So I'm gonna unplug it obviously because you can short something uh, soldering. So I'm gonna leave it there. And so I'm gonna solder this connection. So four and two, I'm just checking one more time. And should be this one. Looks good. So obviously, if you have the choice, uh, always use uh, leaded solder for this kind of stuff. Oops, sorry. I think the other one's the one that's heated up. Yes. All right, so that connection we have, we're good to go. So now I can, all I need to do is to connect this to a ground pin. And like I said, fortunately, almost everything is a ground pin on here because we have this JTAG connector and uh, on an ARM JTAG, uh, most of the signals are ground. So I'm just gonna pick like number four over here and then we can test it. And we can test it by connecting uh, it to power again and also setting the jumper. So we can see now it's in a bootloader mode. How do I know? Because the default firmware that's currently on the board, which would normally run, would toggle the LEDs. So that's not happening. So we know we're probably in the bootloader. So now what we're gonna do is connect the FPGA and actually try to talk to the board. So let's take a look at how that works. Uh, so on, on this board, on this FPGA specifically, what we have is, uh, so we have the we have an FTDI right here, which is connected to the FPGA, which then uh, we can implement logic to talk to any of these pins. But I've already configured uh, the last two pins on this header to be uh, to essentially pass through the signals that are normally connected to the FTDI directly to this board, which means that I can directly communicate with the board uh, once I have it connected there. So I'm going to grab uh, two more connections, two more male to female and uh, connect them. Connect them up. So it's gonna be on pins. So these, I'm gonna connect them to the UART pins of this guy. 
So the TX and the RX of this guy, I'm just going to connect right here. And then uh, I'm actually, so wait, uh, I might have the same problem. So uh, I'm actually going to switch to another machine. So let's see if it works. It looks like it's working. And here I have uh, VMware running. So which means that I should be able to Oops, log into this VMware. If I don't mistype the password. All right, so basically right now uh, we can actually connect using Picocom. So if I look, there's Picocom. Uh, I can connect uh, over to this device and we can actually uh, try to talk to it. So what's the problem? So I think I need to, let's uh, reconnect the FPGA just in case. Let's make sure we connect it to the VM. And we have to now unfortunately do one more thing, which is we have to flash the, the FPGA. So I'm gonna auto connect to the FPGA. Let's do it. So we're gonna connect. We're gonna, so it's gonna output into here and we're gonna program it. And then we can actually play around with PicoCom. Okay, so I don't have it on the screen, but if you uh, were to read the documentation, the first thing that we actually have to send the board is a question mark. So let's try that. And if it doesn't work, that means that we might have TX and RX uh, uh, wrong. So let me just check that I am typing it correctly, just in case. So let's check if we have TX and RX wrong. I'll restart this one more time. Let's try it one more time. No, so it's not working. So let's swap these two. So I'm gonna swap these two. All right, so there we got synchronized. So now if I actually type synchronized without making any typos. So if you look really closely, let me make this larger. If you look really closely, what you will see is the S and the Y and this bottom line, uh, the S and the Y and this bottom line are gonna get overwritten uh, just because the board doesn't send a new line back for whatever reason. So I'm gonna type synchronize. So it's sent back okay, so that command was fine. So now I need to give it a, a frequency for the crystal. I mean, this is also just straight from the data sheet. We'll tell it 10,000. Uh, this doesn't really matter, but we, it, we need it as a command to actually initialize the bootloader. Okay, so it's happy. So now I can actually go ahead and uh, read and write uh, to send read and write commands. So uh, in this case, the commands, when it returns something, they'll actually be UU encoded. So ignore that for now. Uh, I mean, it's not super important. It's just the encoding that NXP selected for this chip. So I'm gonna send R04 and you'll actually see I get something back. So uh, I'm actually able to read and write this chip. So this chip is not currently locked. So uh, that's a problem. So let's do it one more time. So uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna quickly uh, just by, uh, I'm just quickly gonna uh, switch screens again. And this time we'll use terminal. So uh, what I'm gonna do is share this one now. Uh, actually, let's do application window. Let's go to Oops, uh, all right, so uh, let's go to this one right here. So let's uh, share the terminal window. All right, so uh, here's the terminal window. Uh, now all I'm gonna do, so the cool thing about this bootloader, I told you that there's a UART bootloader. There also happens to be a USB bootloader and the USB bootloader is super nice for uh, the USB bootloader. So wait, let me see. Uh, the, boot, the, the USB bootloader is super nice for um, for flashing this guy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit reset. Uh, and now uh, if I actually look, uh, if you know macOS, then under volumes, we'll see, uh, we should uh, see this guy pop up. So let's do it one more time. Let's see it, so it's still not there. So let's go to, let's just go to volumes. So, uh, oh, it actually is there. So it's, it's called CRP disabled in this case. So what I can actually do if I go back, is uh, if I copy, for example, uh, CRP with uh, binary, I can actually go to volume CRP disabled. And 
uh, I can overwrite from where I've been. So now if I do that and I hit reset one more time, what actually happens on the host is this will come up and this will no longer be CRP disabled. This will be CRP enabled. And if we actually try to read the firmware that's on there now, so I might have, I probably should have shown you before, you can see everything zeroed. So clearly the security has been implemented correctly on this chip. So uh, you'll see we can't read any values, even though I just wrote a binary and trust me, this binary is not all zeros. Uh, it's not, it's not letting me see it. More of our, so now if we switch over to the other machine again, uh, so if I st stop this guy right here, if we uh, switch over to the other one and switch back to VMware, uh, and now we do the exact same thing. So I'm going to reset it. I'm going to reconnect uh, the connection that I need to be in the UART bootloader. I'm going to send a question mark again. We can see synchronized. I'm going to type synchronized. Uh, I'm going to do 10,000. And uh, so right now, the CRP1, it basically enables all the security, but the bootloader, the boot ROM code is still there. So we can actually communicate with it, debug it, play around with it, et cetera. Uh, don't ask me. I mean, technically, we'd still be able to update the firmware, but we can't read it off of there. So let's uh, pretend this is some super important binary, and we actually want to pull it off of this device. So uh, let's try to do it. So I'm going to do R04. And if you look, we got a 19 uh, code as our return value. So that if you look before, the value that we got was a zero. So if you look up in the data sheet, a zero means a command success. And a 19 actually means, uh, so this value right here, the, uh, the 19, if I could click, the 19 uh, at the beginning of that line, uh, what, what it actually means is where uh, we were unable to read because uh, this chip is actually uh, has protections enabled. So. Next step is actually to modify. Uh, so uh, uh, let's let's talk about the strategy real quick. So uh, I have a I have a script already ready. I have the logic ready uh, for the FPGA as well. So if we actually try to uh, run the script that I have right now, so I, I have this Python script right here. So let's try to run it. So you'll see uh, what this Python script is actually doing is it's uh, running against the uh, the binary there, and it's just checking. It's trying to reset it. It's checking like. Are you good? Are you good? Can can I read? Can I read? And you'll see that every single time it's getting uh, it's getting values back where the device reports back that it's locked, so it's not working. So uh, we need to make a modification. So we we actually need to implement the the glitch. So let's do that. So we need to make a couple more modifications to the board. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and let's go back to the camera. So to to uh, to the actual boards. So we need to make uh, a couple more modifications uh, for that. And let's do them. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove uh, any uh, filter capacitors that we might have uh, on the on the board. So let me just make sure that uh, the video is good so that everyone sees it. So I'm going to disconnect everything. So we need to make a couple more modifications. So uh, first modification is going to be also let me make sure my irons are hot. Uh, the first modification we're going to make is uh, we're going to remove uh, two capacitors. So we actually have a, a capacitor right here. Uh, and this is, let me see if I can get just a little bit more zoom. No, unfortunately, I can't. So uh, we have a capacitor right here. And we also have a capacitor uh, right here that we want to remove. So for this, uh, I'm just going to move this out of the way. And I'm going to move the other cable out of the way. I mean, for this, uh, if you're asking me, uh, the easiest way to do it is always uh, just to use two irons for moving the capacitors. And after we do that, we actually have uh, these are these shunt pads, which we have on this board uh, right here. So you'll see uh, one's labeled 3.3 volt uh, IO and the other one's uh, labeled 3.3 volt core. So these are two pads. If we cut with uh, using, a, for example, a scalpel or even a Swiss Army knife is what I usually end up using. If we cut them between, between there, what ends up happening is we've disconnected this entire chip from uh, the outside world. So that means we can now directly inject the voltage uh, onto, onto this board. So if you wanted to, you could actually go and uh, connect this to a breakout board. So uh, I can't see. I thought I might have some uh, right here, but I don't see them off the top of my head. But or 
uh, I don't see one right away. But basically, it turns out it's easier to modify this board uh, than it is uh, to to actually desolder the chip, put it onto a blank board, and uh, go from there. So uh, that's what we're going to do. So uh, let's do it. So I'm going to cut. I'm going to take uh, a knife real quick. Uh, so let's also use the, the multimeter that I have right here. So we're going to go into continuity mode. Let's check the connections that they're still there. So between this guy and this guy. So you can hopefully hear the beep on the stream. So it's beeping, which means there's a connection there and there's a connection there. So now let's cut through those and uh, we'll have separated the power supply from the rest of the board. So I'm just gonna grab a uh, the short knife like this one. And so people uh, that have tried uh, playing, playing along and uh, doing this as well, people always ask me, how do you know uh, if you've done it correctly, and the answer is, if you hear a crunching noise, then you're probably deep enough to have cut through the wire. So uh, you can actually, uh, I mean, you can't feel it on the stream, but trust me, you can feel uh, the connection right there. So let's take a look. So I'm gonna leave the knife right there. And now let's take a look with our multimeter again. Let's make sure there's no more connection there because now we'll have separated our power supply. So it sounds good. So if I tap this, there is a connection, but if I tap the pads, there isn't. So one more time. All right, we're good to go. So now we can actually solder uh, two wires onto there and uh, make the all the necessary uh, modifications. So let's do, let's remove the capacitors first though. Uh, for that, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna make sure both my irons are hot. They both uh, seem to be warm. And so I'm gonna use two irons for this. Uh, you, should, you should always get two nice irons and then uh, it turns out that stuff like this is super easy. So I'm just gonna warm it up on both sides and uh, remove it that way. Uh, and same thing on, on this guy right here. Just warm it up on both sides and it should come right off. So we're good to go. So now I remove the capacitors because of course, anyone who remembers their university lecture on capacitors, capacitors work uh, as filters as well. And so that's why we don't want them. That's why we wanna get them out of the way. So uh, capacitors removed, uh, let's try, now we need to solder two wires onto there. So fortunately, while Thomas was doing his part, I've already prepared the wires. So I took a regular jumper wire, I cut it in half, uh, I cut it in half, and uh, basically braided them just simply by twisting. So twisting like this. Uh, and now they're pretty much good to go. So for that, I will still need one of the irons to actually be able to uh, prepare this. And I'll also need the solder, of course. So if you're doing something like this, uh, it's also always nice to have flux because flux always makes your life easier. So uh, I have this nice rubber pad so we can just prep it with some flux. I mean, it doesn't really matter if it's if it's too much. If you pour a little puddle, uh, it'll be fun. So I'm also gonna prep uh, the places where I'm gonna solder it in a second. And let's go for it. So I'm gonna go like this and I'm just gonna prepare my tip. And then I'm gonna take one of these guys and I will just get this entire edge filled with solder. Okay, and you saw I had so much that it even, some of it even fell off the tip, but it doesn't matter because we just need solder on there. Uh, so now let's do the second tip, uh, this, the tip of the second wire. And so if you ever watch, uh, I mean, if you solder enough, you'll also eventually, you might end up noticing that uh, Sometimes the solder, it doesn't latch on to, it doesn't hold on to the end of the braided wire as well. So it's usually a good idea if you have the chance uh, to, to cut off the tips because usually there's no solder there. So that's what I'm also gonna do. So again, for this, our trusty uh, Victronics cyber tool. So I'm just looking for the scissors. So there we have the scissors. So I'm just gonna cut off a little piece of this. I'm gonna cut off a piece there. And I'm also going to cut off a piece here. Okay. And so now, uh, the, so now we actually want to uh, mate this on here. So let's try it. So we're going to create a pad. So I'm going to hold this onto here and 
try to put some solder down to create a pad. And I also need a connection on this other pad. So exact same strategy. So you see, I'm not trying to put uh, too much solder down, uh, just enough, just enough uh, for me to be able to to connect everything there. So let's go. And so, how do you know if it's there? If you can drag the board by it, then you're probably good. And finally, let's do the second one. So I have to bend it a little bit just because I want to make sure I don't have any excess tension there. And that wasn't good enough. All right, but the second one was. So last check. Let's check if it beeps because we don't want to short. Otherwise, it'll be hard to actually perform the glitch. So. Uh, Wrong mode. All right, we're good, because you can see, so I'm holding the one side of the wire. Uh, I'm holding uh, the probe, the probe there. Uh, and I'm also holding, uh, connecting the probe to the other side. So if I touch the pad, it's good. Uh, but the other side is not connected. And this side's good and the other side is not connected. So we're good. So basically, uh, just with that quick modification, what we've eliminated is all this, all these electronic components that are otherwise on this board, uh, which would have just made our life uh, slightly more miserable. All right, so now we need a couple more connections. Uh, so let's take a look at this guy right here. So all this is, uh, I had this in the slides, is a multiplexer board. So if you look really closely, uh, let me try to unwind it a little bit just by moving it like this. So here's the multiplexer board. So if you look really closely, you'll quickly realize that almost everything is actually connected. Uh, so almost everything, so all these dark and more or less neutral colors, except for the green uh, wire, are actually connected uh, are actually connected to ground. So I have a bunch of ground connections here. Uh, and so those are just ground. So whenever you have an analog device, uh, you want to make sure that you don't use any of the inputs that uh, are not part of the circuit, essentially. So everything that I'm not using, I'm getting rid of. So I still need to connect uh, the TX and RX of the board. So I still need to connect the TX and RX. And so I'm going to connect them right there. Uh, that's where the TX and RX are exposed. So these orange wires, I'll want to connect to uh, the uh, actual output of this multiplexer. So if you look, uh, I mean, this is, uh, if you look, the wherever we have this yellow wire is where the output is going to be according to the schematic of the, of the in the data sheet uh, for this multiplexer. So what I actually need to do is uh, I want to make sure that I don't have any bad connections, i.e., uh, I, I want to make sure that I don't, uh, or I want to make sure that I don't uh, accidentally break the soldering work that we just did. So I'm going to grab a, a uh, let's grab two male, uh, or sorry, two male to female jumpers, and we're going to connect them right here. So we're going to connect them to this guy, and we're going to connect them to this guy. Boom. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit just because it's getting intense. So we have these two connections going on now. So these yellow wires are our actual uh, voltage signals. So I'm going to connect them to where we have the yellow wire over here. And let's connect the second one as well. All right. So we should be uh, more or less uh, good to go. So one more important thing is, of course, we need ground. So where's, uh, let's check ground on this guy. So one second. Uh, so for that. All right, let me do this. All right, let's try to connect the ground. Uh, I just need one more male or female. Let's go for it. And I mean, we can also take a look down here. So the ground, uh, I'm pretty sure it's the outer one. That's the ground plane. 
if I remember this board correctly. So let's connect this guy to ground. So we can also connect to the FPGA. So we have ground pins over here. And so we should be good to go. Uh, and now we still need to connect uh, this guy right here. Uh, so uh, what this guy is, is this is actually these really nice Chinese power supplies you can get nowadays. So uh, everyone in my family would ask me why I don't throw away the Linksys power supplies. So you, the, you just feed a barrel jack into this guy uh, and uh, you can essentially generate any voltage you want. So let's just for now, for testing purposes, let's set the voltage to, for example, uh, so I actually have it, uh, if you look up top, you'll see I have uh, 1.62 volts as the limit. Uh, and then we also have a current limit of 20 milliamps uh, set. This is more than enough. So let's uh, set the output to go high. And we can see no short because the, the current, there's no current. So uh, let's connect these guys. So I'm going to connect one to ground, just like we did with uh, this guy. And I'm going to connect the second one to, let me take a look. So I'm gonna connect the second one to this guy right here. So this red cable is gonna be our second input. And afterwards, we should be good to go. All right. So hopefully it focuses now. So everything's connected. So we should be good to go. So power supply, let me turn it up. Uh, Hopefully you can see it. Uh, there we go. So hopefully you can see it there on the screen. So I'm gonna just a quick test, sanity check. So we can see it's all good. Uh, power supply is good, so nothing shorted. Uh, there's no current going through. So the last sanity check I would actually do is to take the, the multimeter and check the voltage. So let's try to do that. And right now uh, the voltage should be uh, whatever we're outputting from the power supply. So let's take a look. So for that, I have this guy right here. Let's connect it over here. And let's connect this one over here. So it's slightly off the screen. Uh, unfortunately, with my lamp, it's coming off. So you'll have to take my word for it. But we're getting the 1.62 uh, volts on the output. So we should be good to go. So let's connect. Uh, we also fortunately have an oscilloscope for this and we can make sure that everything's uh, working. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is, uh, so one more important step is I need one more male or female to connect the reset. So let's take a look at the, there should be a reset pin right here. And uh, let's share the screen on our VMware uh, machine. And let's switch over there. And we should be able to take a look from VMware. So the only thing that I uh, unfortunately don't remember exactly, so let's take a look uh, just to be on the safe side, is which pin that I use for the reset. So I'm gonna open up what's known as the constraint file. So this is the file that maps uh, signals uh, from one pin to the other. So we can see uh, the next pin, the third pin on this header is the actual reset pin. So I'm gonna connect it there. Uh, so last thing I'm going to try is, uh, so let's see one more thing. So I'm going to reconnect this guy. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to make sure we can program the device. And last thing I'm just going to do is check that the TX and RX are fine. So I'm going to try PicoCom one more time, send a question mark. So right now, uh, I don't see anything. So let me make sure it's not the TX and RX being connected backwards. So let's try to reset. Let's do it one more time. This is still nothing. Uh, so one more. Let's see here. Let me try one more thing. So oh, let me just make sure. Yeah, so this is going to be the ground. So, oh, uh, I see the issue. We actually lost this uh, connection right here. So let's fix that really quickly. So unfortunately, our irons both turned off. 
So I'm gonna also gonna unplug this guy. And I'm also going to unplug this guy just to be on the safe side. So let's do it. Let's fix it. So which one did we lose? We lost the one over here. So now the wires are getting in the way a little bit. So let me turn this around and do it from here. All right, but unfortunately, I mean, so let's try one more time. So let's get this guy. connect this guy over here let's boot this guy up so this guy's good to go so now let's connect reconnect the USB USB should be good to go so we're reconnecting this guy to this VM let's set it to remember so it's complaining that the hardware shut down let's try it one more time program and uh, so that part worked. So let's try PicoCom one more time. And I'm going to send a question mark. So nothing. So maybe the TX and RX were not backwards. Oh, I actually see what the, we forgot one more connection, which was we didn't supply the connection to the power supply. So let me, Get that. All right. Uh, so let's try one more time. And if it's not this, it's going to be the TX and RX being backwards. So let's try one more time. So there we go, we have synchronized. So uh, what does that mean? So uh, all the connections are good. So I'm actually powering it at the lower voltage, which I showed you uh, before on the power supply. And so now we can actually take a look and of how this runs and uh, let it run and basically watch uh, the oscilloscope instead. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect um, my oscilloscope really quick and I'm gonna connect it to uh, the output wire, which is gonna be this guy over here, and I'm also going to, so I also will need a ground for the oscilloscope. So let's connect that. And finally, uh, so we have the ground uh, gonna go. Uh, and finally, we also probably wanna connect a reset. So for that, we'll also wanna ground and we'll make sure the other signal is blue, uh, just, to, just to be nice and matching. So let's connect it. And uh, so let me show you these connections real, real quick, uh, just cause I'll start the, the, I'll start the Python script. That part is not uh, uh, all that exciting. So I'm gonna connect uh, the ground. So let's just use the grounds uh, that we have right here on the FPJ because they're easy to get to. And finally, uh, we need to connect this reset signal. So the reset signal is this white wire right here. Uh, I'm gonna be lazy. I'm gonna extend this reset wire, basically make it longer. I'm gonna add another male to female to it. And that means that in between, I can clip on, uh, I can clip on uh, the probe. So let's connect this guy right here to the reset signal. Boom. So should be good to go. So uh, now let's switch to the oscilloscope and let me actually start the script so that we see stuff. So I'm gonna hit control AX, uh, but uh, I'm just gonna start the script. All right, so uh, now let's configure our trigger really quickly. So let's get rid of this guy and this guy because we know there's nothing there and let's set our mode to auto initially, uh, and let's make sure that, let's figure out which channel we're actually triggering on. So we're triggering off of channel four. Uh, let's set it to 
let's do it to channel. Let's do it on channel two. All right, channel two. And so now let's figure out where our level is. So here we go. So it was at. So let's get rid of this mini right here. And we can see the trigger right there. So now if we zoom in, we can see, uh, so the blue signal right now uh, on the screen, uh, the blue signal is uh, is the reset signal. So hopefully uh, that's coming coming across a little bit. So it is, I am, I am moving it around. Uh, so let's switch back. I think the compression was was killing it. So, so it is, it was still running. So let's make sure we didn't lose it. So there we go. So it should be, should be updating on the, on the screen. So let's go back. There we go. So uh, it's updating on the screen. So you can see uh, just the, the little bit of jiggling that it's doing. It means uh, it's actually, it's actually updating. So let's take a look. So we should also have the glitch signal. So the now uh, the glitch signal currently we still haven't connected the um, we still haven't connected. We have, we're missing one more signal, which is the actual VCC select. So that's on pin 34. So I'll show you me connecting that signal right here. So right now we're going to connect this green wire. Uh, we're going to connect to pin 34. So 34 fortunately is this guy right here it should be this guy on the second header. So let's take a look. So let me just make sure. So yeah, IO 34. So that should be good. And there we go. I already see it. So we're going to head over to here on the uh, oscilloscope. We're going to head over to here. And so if you look at uh, the blue signal, you'll see there's a dip. And that's the reset. And this is our actual glitch signal. So you can see right here. So what's happening is the board's power cycling. And then we're dipping the voltage at different points in time and just letting it run. And so you can actually see uh, this going across the screen. Uh, we can move this guy down a little bit, make it a little bit bigger, just so that everyone can see it. So you can see the voltage. It's dipping from approximately uh, 1.6 volts uh, to lower. And we're just going across. And so let me just briefly, uh, for completeness, show you what the Python script is doing as well. Because uh, once you've seen the glitch actually work on the oscilloscope, uh, you actually want to see uh, the Python script running. So let's go over to here. Uh, and you'll see the Python scripts running the entire time. So let's even go to full screen. So uh, one thing that you could actually do, so I'm, I'm not going to touch it uh, so much, but uh, one thing that you can actually do is you can lower the voltage and just see where the limit of the system is. So I'm going to start lowering the voltage a little bit, and you'll see that at some point uh, it'll just we'll just get complete garbage. And uh, so essentially right there, that means we've gone too low on the voltage. Uh, otherwise, we'll just let it run. So usually... Uh, with this kind of board, uh, the values uh, where it successfully where it will succeed to glitch the board will be about uh, 5,400, some, something like that. I mean, it depends on the voltage a little bit, but, but right around that value. Very rarely uh, do you have to run it multiple times for it to actually for it to actually uh, output something uh, or for it to actually crash. Uh, but essentially, uh, you just let it run like this, and eventually, it finds the correct position. So I'm going to check the chat, uh, which I haven't been doing uh, during this session. And let's take a look. So, I mean, if there are any questions, I'd be welcome to, to entertain some. Otherwise, we'll just take a, take a look at this running. So whichever... I don't know what's more interesting, the Python output. So maybe I'll just comment on the Python output really quickly. So uh, the first number is the actual delay in clock cycles of the FPGA. Uh, the second number is uh, the width. So that's how many clock cycles we're holding the line low. And we're iterating over this many uh, times in a row and uh, just letting it run 
one until we find uh, the correct position. So uh, very rarely, uh, we might have missed it at the beginning where we didn't have all the connections, but I'm pretty confident we're still gonna, this is still gonna succeed. It just hasn't hit the, the right value yet. So we're just gonna let it run and it will eventually succeed. And uh, this is a, uh, so I saw, uh, so there we go. Uh, you, you see expected one. So what it's actually checking is it's checking the UART output of the device. Uh, it's checking the UART output that it gets back from uh, running this script against the device. Every single time it's issuing a read command and then it's checking whether it got a zero or a one. Because we know that the case where it succeeds, it will actually return uh, a zero. And wherever it fails, it'll return a 19. But 19, of course, starts with a, a one. So that's the output that we're checking. So if I was to connect over Picocom uh, right now, I could do R04. Fortunately, I also have a script. Uh, it's called DumpPy. So this is just a script which actually converts the UU encoded uh, data and uh, dumps, lets us dump uh, the, the binary that's on there. So I'm gonna run it and you can see we're dumping the binary uh, it's working. So we've succeeded to boot the chip in such a mode where we've defeated its security. And now we're able to uh, pull the firmware off of there. So if this was, I mean, so basically what we just did is we took a device which had no security set. We set the security and we kind of practiced uh, the attack uh, against this family of microcontrollers. And we did it all in however many minutes I've been going. Uh, but uh, so essentially we've done our homework. So now if we ever come across an NXP LPC, and I can tell you from experience, this applies to NXP LPC 17, NXP LPC 13. I mean, basically every NXP LPC is susceptible to this because they all share this low level code in the boot ROM, uh, which, uh, and this low level vulnerability that you can find using, for example, Gidra uh, to figure out uh, what's going on uh, inside of there. And so, uh, I mean, I can show you the most interesting thing is if I hit control C and I scroll back, uh, if you recall the values that we are actually setting are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So in this case, it should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because I set it to CRP one. So I programmed, oops, I put a binary on there that is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if I go to two FC, we can check which word uh, is actually uh, written to that location uh, and oh, I scrolled past it. So here you go, right here. So you can see at 2FC, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So even though this device is secure, even though the actual physical contents of flash have the correct value, uh, at the moment of time at which it booted by toggling, by playing with the voltage and uh, ensuring that the, that the system booted in an unstable state, uh, what we did is uh, we made sure that the single read where it checks that value in the boot ROM, uh, it read something else. So what might it have written, r read from the flash? Well, maybe it read zero, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, something like that. Maybe it corrupted the eight. Uh, I don't know which bit it corrupted. All I know is that it read some value which was not one of the four values that locked the device. And how do I know that? Because the device managed to boot in a state where we were able to get into it and dump uh, its contents. So we somehow corrupted this value at the one point in time at which uh, it gets read during boot. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, that's like a very short intro to glitching. I did see there's a couple questions in chat, so I'm gonna switch to that really quickly. So let me, let me do that. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then switch back to the camera if you guys have any, any questions for me. So I did see uh, the first question. So let me, let me grab, just cause I had Slack open on this machine. So, um, so the first question was uh, the 4919. So I'm using the, I believe it's the, I always forget, it's the 4617, uh, I think is uh, what I'm using. Uh, I'll get back to you in the chat uh, if you, I'm, I'm unsure right now and with the lights I can't read it directly off the chip. But uh, it does have, uh, so the question was, it has quite a bit of resistance. And so uh, the answer is yes, it does have quite a bit of resistance, but this actually isn't uh, an issue for uh, glitching because all we need to do is to make sure that the power that's actually arriving at the device is so low uh, that uh, it, it's corrupting uh, this, I mean, it's corrupting the value. All we need to do is to make sure that we're 
pulling the low voltage low enough to where it fails to read the single uh, value correctly. So even though it has a high resistance, uh, something like a microcontroller, since it pulls so little current, uh, it won't actually have an issue uh, running. Uh, it won't actually have an issue uh, with something, something like this. So uh, not to worry. Uh, and then finally, uh, so there was another question. Uh, you have the FPGA connect to the reset pin to the power supply via the multiplexer uh, with a Python script. You interface with the FPGA over UART and vary the delay of the width of the glitch. So yes, uh, all parts of that statement were correct. So what you can actually do with the FPGA, so if I switch, uh, so what's actually happening is uh, I'm implementing. Uh, I'm implementing on the FPGA on the on the actual FPGA. I'm implementing a state machine which is parsing uh, its command, which sets the delay and the width. And uh, but basically, we have the good fortune of the microcontroller. So the redboard that we're actually glitching. This redboard is. Uh, so this redboard actually has. Uh, so this redboard uh, also uses UART. So all we need is UART to communicate to the FPGA and can communicate to the um, to the uh, microcontroller board. So moreover, uh, in our case, the microcontroller board actually has an additional feature, which is uh, it only uses because it uses UU encoding. You'll see that there's no binary data uh, that falls into uh, essentially valid encoding. So what that means is you can send data directly uh, through the FPGA as long as it's it has uh, uh, essentially a non-printable byte in front of it. And then you can process these special bytes to issue commands to the FPGA to basically tell the state machine, hey, this is a configure the next two or three bytes are configuration bytes. Take that configuration, uh, load them into the registers of the state machine, and uh, basically have at it. So, I mean, this is uh, kind of getting to the kind of stuff that w we teach in some of our classes. I mean, this is uh, this is an assignment that we would normally do uh, from scratch and let everyone implement this and and basically do it. But uh, just to give you a feeling for it, uh, using the correct programming language, i.e., Verilog, this is uh, only let's say uh, maybe 50 lines of code, something like that. So it's very little uh, code that you actually need to implement in the FPGA just because it's essentially a state machine with two counters. Uh, so would the NXP uh, PN547 uh, be susceptible to this? Uh, so I'm not familiar with that one. I mean, this is really uh, the the issue here is that NXP uses this. Uh, I mean, which is typical for a company making uh, embedded microcontrollers. Uh, they a lot of times. Uh, so let me just set that aside. A lot of times uh, they'll use the exact same boot ROM across multiple devices. So they'll write it once and then use it in every single member of the family. And so that's the biggest issue uh, that we're seeing right here. So uh, basically every NXP LPC, doesn't matter whether it's automotive, uh, whether it's used in planes, what have you, uh, they're all going to be susceptible to this. I mean, I've seen uh, there's a, a substantial amount of like USB devices that also use them. I mean, they're not as popular as the STM32s, uh, but they are uh, popular uh, nonetheless. So uh, those kinds of devices uh, have them as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, so, but uh, if you're looking at larger devices, I mean, there's, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. So if you're talking about something like an SOC, ironically, uh, ironically, the more complex the system is, the easier it is to pull off uh, an attack like this. So if you look, uh, I mean, some people think that uh, even the iPhone boot ROM glitches were initially found uh, using glitching uh, similar to what we're doing here. Uh, additionally, uh, there's been work, uh, for example, against the STM32. So the STM32 is actually an interesting example because the STM32 uses uh, an internal power supply, which is, in that sense, in it's fairly similar to uh, what you would uh, see on larger devices. So let's say an ARM SOC or something like that. So uh, basically, you also have to deal with uh, all the things related to having an external power supply and internal power supply. I mean, ultimately, that's the, the biggest issue that you'll you'll have when you're uh, glitching or trying to apply this attack to, to larger uh, devices. So if you uh, are actually looking to try this out against something like 
like an SFC or something like that, I recommend you start with, uh, I mean, the SCM32 is probably the best example uh, we've come across uh, just because the SCM32, especially the F2, I mean, the F2, uh, I can say just because Thomas and I did a talk at uh, CCC about glitching the SCM32 F2. That one's particularly easy once you know all the tricks, uh, but it's also very close to what you would see in a larger device like uh, an SOC. So let me check chat one more time. But if not, uh, I think that pretty much uh, covers it. So at least a second ago was the last question. So yeah, uh, so that's pretty much it. So uh, I, I, so if uh, if you guys are interested in this stuff, I mean, uh, whether, whether that's uh, doing uh, stuff on the FPGA, uh, so doing stuff on the FPGA, or... Uh, So whether, yeah, so if, if you guys are interested in this stuff, whether it's doing it on the FPGA or it's uh, doing it, uh, doing the kind of stuff that Thomas was showing in Gidra, then uh, make sure to check us out. So, uh, and you guys can uh, feel free to use Hack in the Box as a discount code to register for so, some of our classes. Uh, we'll be happy to, to see you there and to show uh, some of this stuff uh, when you're when you're doing one of our classes, and specifically, I mean, whether that was the stuff that Thomas was showing today with SVD loader or this kind of stuff, I mean, that's what that's the kind of material we cover in our trainings. So, thank you for listening in on this one. Cool. Thank you very much.